Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen and amen. We gather in God's presence because God has called us to be his people. God has called us into God's mission and service in this world. So we come to honor the God who has created us, the God who has redeemed us, and the God who has called us. We come to remember who God is. We come to remember who we are. And we come to hear again the calling of God's Spirit to us to join God, work, God in God's redemptive work in this world. So welcome to the worship of God on this Sunday. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, we are glad that you are here. And we pray that this time of worship will help you to see yourself in relation to God more clearly and to understand God's claim and God's call on your life. So may we worship God in spirit and in truth.
I invite you to share with me in our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's God's steadfast steadfast love love endures endures forever. forever. Good morning and welcome once again to our worship service here at Linden Baptist Church. Today we'll tell again the story of God and his people the story of God's great love for us and the great love of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we worship together in the unity of the Spirit, our God three in one. So this morning, let's give God the glory for the many, many great things he's done in our lives and in this world. pray together. What can we bring before you, O God, for your great goodness and love and mercy, your providence and your care for this whole world? What can we bring before you to express our thanksgiving and our wonder and our awe? We praise you with our lips We pray that we will also praise you with our deeds, that we will also praise you with the very depths of our being, our wills, our purpose, our action. Lord, surely there is no one like you in all of heaven and in earth. Surely there is no one worthy of our life devotion than you. 
So we bring ourselves to you. And we, we place ourselves at your feet and lay ourselves in your hands and pray that you will do with us as you will. For you are surely a God of mercy and love and grace. We know this because of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The scriptures today tell us that Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world. The world was standing condemned already, but instead Jesus came to invite us into life, abundant life, through him, God himself. As we turn to a time of confession, we recall that we've been tempted many times to sin, and we have succumbed to that temptation but Jesus, God himself, came into the world, tempted in every way that we've been tempted, but yet he was without sin. And Jesus didn't come to even lord himself over us in life, but he says he came not to be served, but to be a servant and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we praise Jesus today, our perfect Savior, and we confess our sins knowing that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love for us.
We live in a world of self-sufficiency. We live in a world of self-absorption. Uh, we live in a world where the value of self-realization is a primary target for most of us in our lives. The gospel calls us to remember, though, that we will only realize our true humanity, we will only realize our true identity when we recognize that God is our creator. God is the one who has brought us into being. And it is on God that we depend for all of our lives. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, it is on God that we depend for our relationship with God and for the, the health and well-being of the human community. Confession is a time where we draw ourselves away from our self-absorption and place our, hand, our hands again in God's hands to place our lives before God once again, recognizing our need for God's mercy, God's grace, God's strength, God's wisdom, and God's help in every endeavor of our lives. So I invite you to join with me in this time of confession. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. For people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us uncover our sin before the liberating light of Christ. Will you pray with me? Merciful God, we confess the folly of our sin and the hypocrisy of our complaints. We grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources while hoarding earth's goods and cheating the poor. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not actively work to address them. Merciful God, expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin and free us from our foolish ways, that we may know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. As we think of our pardon from God himself, we celebrate the love of God and the mercy of God. We do pray that we can show that grace and mercy to others. Let's remember once again, Jesus came into the world to save the world. Let's sing, because he lives, knowing that we can face any trial here on earth through the power of Jesus that loves us.
Will you bow with me? Guide us, O God, by your word and your spirit, that in your light we may see light. In your truth, find freedom, and in your will, find peace. Open our minds as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. Lead us to your truth and teach us your will. Amen. A reading from Numbers, chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out to the way by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. When the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. We continue singing our psalms responsively during Lent. Today we'll read Psalm 107 and sing all the ends of the earth shall remember. No, we're singing a different word. We'll be singing, You Delivered Your People From Their Distress. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Reading from Ephesians 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, 
and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. Gospel, we'll sing Praise We Now, the Word of Grace. Gospel of John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believed in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory and honor and power and might now and forever. Amen. In the passage that we read earlier in the service from the book of Numbers, we have this interesting encounter. The people of Israel have just actually, by God's hand, been delivered from a Canaanite king. They were, by God's intervention, God handed the Canaanites over to the Israelites. And the towns of the Canaanites became the towns of the Israelites. But almost immediately upon seeing God's mercy and God's grace visited on them and helping them to be delivered from the hands of those who would harm them and their enemies, they began to complain. They began to complain against Moses, 
kind of a complaint that we hear from them over and over again. Why have you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? For there is no food out here and we detest this manna. They detested what God had given them. One could almost suppose that in that story of the people complaining against Moses, that we see a lot of what's wrong in the human family, in the human community. There's strong words that these people offered. For they said to Moses, we detest, we detest the food, this miserable food, the food that God has given us, we detest. It's hard to think that perhaps the heart of sin is that we as human beings have come to detest the very gifts of God that sustain our lives. We have come to see as miserable the instructions and the teachings of God that would help us to be more fully human, that would help us to live in a more authentic and whole and healthy human community. We have come to detest and see as miserable the gifts of God to us. Now God does an, an interesting thing in that Numbers passage. God sends poisonous snakes. It's almost as if God is saying to them, if you want to know what misery is, well, let me show you what misery is, is about. He sends these poisonous snakes and they bit the people and many of them died. So the people then realized that in detesting and seeing as miserable that which God has graciously provided them, they have sinned against God and they pray that God would deliver them from the serpents. And so God says to Moses, I want you to make a poisonous serpent. I want you to take one of those serpents and make an image out of it, if you will, and put it on a pole. And then say to the people, anyone who looks at the serpent on the pole, even if you have been bitten, you will live. So Moses put this bronze serpent on a pole. And that image, if you will, of judgment, that image of danger, that image of death became for them, those who would dare to look upon it, the means of life. It's an odd image, isn't it? That by looking upon the very thing that was killing them, they could find life. Cornelius Plantinga, in an article that he wrote called Christ the Snake, says that one of the deepest mysteries of medicine is that the disease often cures the disease. He observes that poison is the antidote to poison. That disease is often the vaccine for disease. Plantinga noticed in his article that Oftentimes the antidote for being bitten by a snake is a, a, a serum that is created out of the venom of other snakes that helps to protect and to diminish the effects of the poison. And we know uh, in all the discussion about vaccines that the way that vaccines work in our body is to take substances from diseases, whether it's smallpox or, or chickenpox or whether it's the flu uh, or the measles or the mumps uh, or even different COVID 
uh, viruses, to take elements of those disease and break them down and inject them into the body so that the body's immune system comes alive and begins to protect us from the disease itself. It is kind of a mystery that the medicine is often the disease and that the disease is often the medicine. I think it's no mystery in some respects that the medical profession has used the image of the serpent on a pole as a sign of healing to reflect on this mystery. When Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he uses the image of Moses lifting up the serpent on the pole as an image of his work and what he has come to do. Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Using that image of Moses lifting up the serpent, I'd like for us just to ponder for a moment the depth of the love of God. Jesus says that I must be lifted up just like that serpent in the wilderness. God's love is demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ in that God takes on God's self our disease. The Apostle Paul writes that God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The early church fathers recognized that it was only when the great physician becomes the patient that we who are the patients can be healed. The Apostle Paul paints a picture of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here in a graphic way that God became sin, that God took on our sin, that God brought into God's very being our sin and our brokenness, our complaints, our rejection, and our, and our, detest, and our de detestation of God's gifts. God brought all that into God's being so that in bringing it into God's being, God could transform it into our healing and our salvation. Now think about that. God who is holy, God who is other, God who is creator, God who is sustainer, God who is perfect, God whose ways are not our ways and whose thoughts are not our thoughts, God dares to take our disease, our sin, and make it a part of his very life so that he can transform the disease into our healing and into our salvation. It is almost incomprehensible to think that, that God whom we have violated, the God whom we have disappointed, the God whom we have complained against, the God whom we have rejected, the God who we have turned away from would still turn toward us and take upon himself all the ugliness of our sin and our brokenness, all the ugliness of our rebellion, all the ugliness of our rejection would take that and lay it into his very heart and transform our sin into our life, into our healing. It's unheard of. It is indeed the scandal of the gospel. It's what we hear, heard Paul talk about last week in our epistle reading, that the cross of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block. It's a scandal 
because no one can believe that God would actually dare to take on our sin, that God would actually make his own son become sin, so that in becoming sin, God may, may bring about the healing of our lives and of the human community. God took on our disease. God loved us so much that God was willing to inject our sin into God's very being so that God could create the possibility of life and health in us. It's astounding. Astounding what God has done. He has taken our poison and created an antidote to it. He has taken our disease and created a way for us to be healed, to be protected. God loves the world so much that God is willing to take our sin. But Jesus goes on in speaking to Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus that God has done this. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, God is doing this in the person of, of my life. In and through me, God is, is providing a way of salvation. But just like the people of Israel had to turn their eyes and look at the serpent on the pole, so if people in this world are going to find healing, the healing that God offers, if we're going to receive the medicine that God provides to heal us from our sin and our brokenness, we, like those Israelites, have to turn our eyes toward the source of our healing. Jesus says that we must turn our eyes and come to the light. The judgment is, is that the light came, the means was provided, the healing source is available, but people chose to reject it rather than receive it. Sometimes we scratch our heads at people who are presented with the options of treatments that could heal them from their disease. Or we scratch our heads at people who are presented with the opportunity of being protected against disease, but who turn away from it. And yet isn't that the condition that so many people in our world are in? God has provided for us the way of salvation. God has provided for us the way of, of life. God has provided for us a means of healing of our brokenness and our sin, our woundedness. God has provided for us the means by which the, the, the rifts and, the, and the, the, the gaps in the human community can be brought together and healed and restored, and yet we so often refuse to turn our eyes. We refuse to turn in the direction and to receive the gift. And Jesus says the judgment is not that God is pronouncing judgment, but that God has provided a means of healing. God has provided a means of grace. God has provided the means of life, and people still would rather die. People will refuse to look and turn their eyes to the source of God's help and God's salvation but to those who do Jesus said to those who do come to the light to those who do turn their eyes toward Jesus they find healing and they find life and they find comfort and they find joy there's an old hymn that we used to sing at revivals. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin, it says. The light of the world is Jesus. 
Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in the light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. Tis shining for thee, sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. The psalm, the song concludes, in a sense, with an invitation. With an invitation for those in our world who are still dying, dying because of being poisoned by sin, by dying because of refusing to look to the source of life. You dwellers in darkness, with sin-blinded eyes. The light of the world is Jesus. Go wash at his bidding and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. Tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. Now we may say that just sounds way too easy. That all I need to do is turn my sin blinded eyes and look upon Jesus. And yet Moses told the people under the instruction of God, all you have to do, all you have to do is turn and gaze upon this serpent all you have to do is gaze upon the means by which God has provided life and salvation for you. All you have to do is turn your eyes in that direction. And the medicine, the healing, the forgiveness, the grace, and the mercy of God will flow into you and wash over you. The light of the world is Jesus. And all Jesus asks of us is that we turn our eyes and look upon him. That we turn our attention and our face toward him. And in the power of the life-giving sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The love and the power and the mercy and the healing and the forgiveness and the grace of God will pour into our lives. John writes in the prologue to his gospel that we who have come to the light of Jesus Christ have received grace upon grace, upon grace. A grace that is given because God loves us so much that God is willing to take our sin into God's own being and transform our sin and death into healing and life. Ain't of that good news. Will you pray with me? God, we recognize that far too often we find ourselves despising the gifts that you give us. Uh, maybe not so blatantly as the Israelites in the wilderness did, but in so many ways we find ourselves deciding that the gifts that you give are not helpful or not good or not for our, our best interest. 
and we turn to ourselves, and in doing so, we put to death the life that you offer. We do damage to our own lives and to the lives of our community. We are overwhelmed at the thought that you would be willing to send your son to become sin so that you may find a way in his death and by his blood to heal us and make us whole. And it's a little bit beyond our comprehension that all you ask of us is that we turn our eyes upon Jesus. And that we see the light of your love and your life in his face. And that we allow the light of your glory and presence to penetrate our sin-blinded eyes and make us whole. We pray in the confidence of the one who came and lived and ministered, who was crucified, dead, and buried, raised again, and has ascended to your right hand in the name of the one who will come again in glory, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we respond to God's word in our lives, let us profess the faith of our baptism as we say, Jesus Christ, brother of light, I believe. I believe that in the beginning was the promise, and the promise was with God, and the promise was God. I believe in the infinite, nurturing creativity of God, in the incarnate, crucified humility of God, in the intimate, inspiring liberality of God. Jesus Christ, brother of light, I believe. In these next moments, will you ponder in your heart how you will respond to the Lord Jesus Christ who became sin for you so that you might find the life of God. come to our time of intercession. And I'd like to remind you that this is a season of prayer, a prayer for North American missions, for the work of the International Mission Board and for the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And as we go to God in prayer, that we pray specifically for those who are serving in North America as they share the gospel. Would you bow with me? Almighty Father, we come relying on your promises, praying for the church, the world, and all in need. You sent your Son that the world might be saved through him inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. During this season of prayer, we remember all who serve on mission fields, especially in North America. 
You know each one. You know their needs. You know their gifts. You provide for every need. May they faithfully serve you in the communities where they, where they live. Grant them wisdom and courage to share the good news of the gospel. We pray for communities in our own state where floodwaters have engulfed their streets, the homes, and businesses. Send laborers to assist in cleanup. Send resources to complete the task. Provide protection as volunteers walk, work alongside residents to restore and clean up their communities. May your love and mercy be evident in the words and the deeds of your people. You sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarcity. Bring peace in places where scarcity brings violence and fear. Fill your people to overflow with your grace as they respond to persons in need of food, shelter, and support. Grant healing to all who are experiencing illness, those recovering from surgery, those facing endless days of isolation, those who find themselves overcome by depression and anxiety. Be an ever-present source of comfort to all who grieve. Bring recon reconciliation to fractured relationships, whether in our families, our communities, or between nations. It is in the name of your Son, our Savior, that we entrust our prayers to you. Amen. Well, as we begin to bring this time of worship to a close, we do remember that our worship continues, though, as we serve God, as we praise God, um, as we minister the grace and the mercy and love of God uh, to our families, our friends, our neighbors, uh, and to our world. As Larice mentioned, we are in a season of prayer for North American missions, uh, work that is being done in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, Central America, uh, places that are part of uh, the North American continent, um, among all kinds of people, different economic groups, different ethnic groups, uh, people in the rural areas, people in the back country, people in the urban areas, all of whom need to hear the life-giving message that Jesus Christ is our life and in our light. So I encourage you in this season of prayer, this week of prayer, to pray. To pray for the witness of the gospel in and through the different mission boards that we support, but also um, in and through the churches in our country, that we may bear an authentic witness to the person of Jesus Christ. And then as you feel led to give uh, to the North American Mission Board or to the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, um, one or both, uh, during this time of prayer and this season of prayer, I would encourage you to make offerings to help support the work of, of those two uh, entities uh, in our continent. Also, tomorrow, begin, we, we will have the second in the series of The Color of Compromise. Uh, we still invite you to join. Even if you missed the first week, uh, the second week will be fine. Come and join us as we listen to Jamar Tisby begin to talk about how it is that race and racism became a part of the DNA, not only of the, the, the structure of our society, but perhaps even of our churches. It's a challenging study. I invite you to come and to be a part of that. If you do not get our Zoom link, please call us or email us, and we'll make sure that you do that so that you can participate. And then this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock on our church's Facebook page, uh, we will be having a program in, entitled Understanding Depression. A lot of people have struggled with that 
uh, during this time of pandemic, and a lot of people struggle with it chronically, whether it's a clinical depression or it's a situational depression. Um, it, it is one of those things that does not easily um, lend itself to quick fix. So we invite you this Thursday evening on our church's Facebook page at 7 o'clock to uh, be a part of this panel uh, discussion, uh, submit your questions on the comment pages, uh, and, uh, and, and enter, engage in that conversation uh, about depression. If you, have, if you yourself are suffering or you know a family member, or loved one, or a co-worker, uh, this would be a great opportunity to, to help get more information and to help learn more about um, this um, this problem uh, that afflicts so many people um, in our in our day and time. So as we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours today and every day. Amen and amen. We love you and God loves you. Let's sing our benediction hymn. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you. Now live in joy as you love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.